Hello, and welcome to the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios of the National Press Foundation in Washington, D.C. My name is Rachel Jones, and I'm the Director of Journalism Initiatives for NPF. We're here today for day two of the Covering Rare Diseases Journalism Fellowship Program. We had a day of intensive conversations yesterday that provided context and insight into the issue of how to cover rare diseases. And so on day two, we'll start a different thread of the conversation. But before we get started, we would like to thank our sponsors, the Foundation Ibsen, for covering and supporting this second year of journalism training for journalists. Journalists around the world have many difficult conversations, and they have them generally often in times of trauma. And they're speaking to people who are dealing with and struggling with the effects of trauma. Well, for this first speaker of the second day of the Covering Rare Diseases session, we are joined by a journalist who embodies so much of that aspect of being a journalist, but it's his experience is deepened by the impact of rare disease in his own life. Richard Engel is joining us from a convoy, I believe, south of Odessa in Ukraine. He is NBC's chief foreign correspondent. And earlier this year, Richard suffer, suffered the unimaginable loss of his six-year-old son, Henry, who died of a condition that in girls is called Rett syndrome, but in boys, it's, there's a different manifestation. And Richard will explain that to us. But before I ask you to speak, Richard, I do want to convey the deepest condolences of NPF and myself and all of those who are watching because the fact that you are willing to share this experience with journalists is incredibly generous of you. So thank you for being here. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Can you take us back to that moment? Uh, Henry was your first child. Tell us about preparing for his arrival and then bring us to the moment that you learned there was something wrong. So um, when Mary, my wife and I decided we were going to have a family and we were excited and we'd get married and we want to have children and we decided to embark on this journey, um, we hadn't really put much thought into rare diseases. We did the basic genetic testing and uh, prenatal scans that, that most people do, that most hospitals do. And everything came out fine. So we didn't anticipate any, any problems. We didn't have uh, any ethical or religious uh, objections to doing prenatal scanning or vaccines. We did, we did everything by the book, so to speak. And when Henry was born, we were overjoyed. And he was a beautiful uh, little, little boy. And, uh, but quite quickly, we realized something was something was wrong something was off uh he wasn't nursing the way he should have he wasn't uh didn't have the kind of energy that uh that babies uh, normally exhibit and we didn't really know how unusual this was because it was our first child and in the first couple of weeks, the doctors were telling us, well, let's just keep this under observation. Perhaps it's not that serious. Maybe it's just, he just needs a little bit of time to, to eat something and drink some things and catch up. And he wasn't really uh, eating very much. And we had to use a, a dropper, sort of like a little syringe to kind of push the, uh, the, the either formula or breast milk into his, into his mouth. And this was... Now, when I look back, all the signs were, were there. Uh, but at the time, you know, when you talk to other people, other parents or grandparents or friends, they want to be reassuring. And they say, well, you know, our child was a late bloomer or this and this happened or I didn't learn to speak until I was you know, two years old. And you hear these stories, which, which can be true or, or they can be, you know, fond memories. So, we, we, we got through a difficult first few months, and I think Mary, uh, my, my wife, noticed that things were 
more severe than I did because Henry didn't, didn't, and, and this is often the case with some of these rare diseases, you don't always particularly at first see anything wrong. Um, physically he looked, he looked perfect, you know, uh, no, no obvious signs of, of any kind of, of, of trauma and when, or any kind of illness. And when we did all the basic tests and we did all the basic tests, redid them because it was strange that why wasn't he suckling and why wasn't he moving as much as, as others. And he did, he did certain things, you know, he flipped over from his stomach to his back. So he did some things that gave us encouragement and he could move and he could, uh, he could feed himself uh, later on. So over the first six months, there was this concern in the background, but it wasn't overwhelming. Uh, I thought we were going to be okay. And that maybe he would need a little bit of extra help a little physical therapy, a little occupational therapy. He'd need a, a bit of a boost, but I didn't realize that the things were going to be be far more serious uh, than than I anticipated. So, uh, at about a year, uh, it was becoming quite clear that things were very wrong. Uh, it was becoming even clear to me, and maybe maybe I didn't see it or I didn't want to see it uh, because. I was seeing him with other children. So we would go to play dates and frankly speaking, you know, and again, like I said, I didn't see it in the first six months, but very, very newborn babies, they don't do that much. You know, they don't really talk and they don't really play with other children and they, they just kind of eat and sleep. But a one-year-old baby does a great deal. One-year-old babies, a lot of them are walking and starting to, uh, make their first kind of verbal sounds. And when, when we started to go to these play dates, it was, a, it was obvious. Something is really wrong here. Uh, some of these other kids were uh, leaps and bounds ahead of him. And I got very, very scared. I said, whatever we're doing, we don't know what we're dealing with here. Uh, this is a real problem. And we got him a genetic test, a full genetic uh, scan, basically, of his entire body. And it took a long time. Those kind of tests were, were quite rare. Uh, they're getting uh, easier, but they're still not that common. And it wasn't until we got the full exome scan, basically a, a breakdown of his entire genetic code, that we knew uh, what the problem was. And his... his um, it, it was so unusual what he had. It took six months for them to give us the results because the geneticists kept going over and over it again, and they didn't understand the results. He had this genetic disorder, which is very, very rare in boys. And so, as you mentioned, uh, and I, I, I'll go if I, if, I, if I may, I'll go into a little bit of of, of genetics in, in a second, but. Um, in girls, there is this fairly common, not fairly common, but it's, it's fairly common, a genetic disorder called Rett syndrome. And it's terrible. It's terrible in girls. It's very severe. And what happens in, in girls is they start to develop and they develop, let's say, normally. They learn, a lot of them learn to walk, they learn to speak. And then when they reach about two years old, they start to regress. So they lose the skills that they had acquired. So they lose the ability to, to use their hands and, and speak and walk, not always, but, but often. And, and that, that's sort of the typical pattern for, for girls. For boys, it's extraordinarily rare because most of these boys don't survive childbirth because in, in girls, not to, and I'm not a scientist here, but unfortunately I've had to learn quite a bit about it. Uh, girls, uh, there's, there's the, X, X, and, and boys are X, Y, you know, X chromosome, Y chromosome. And if, since girls are X, X, it means automatically they have a duplicate. So this genetic mutation is, is on the X chromosome. So if you're a girl and you have X, X, and one of your genes is mutated on the X chromosome, by definition, you have a backup. So in theory, girls should never get 
Rhett disorder because it, if it's on the X chromosome and they have a backup, well, then the backup should just kick in. But unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. What happens is the gene, which is on the X chromosome, starts to work and these girls do develop. And then it, the two of them effectively fight each other and cancel each other out. And you see this, this terrible regression, which is very painful for parents to watch and baffling and, and, and traumatic. And they've got this, this little beautiful little girl and they don't see anything wrong. And then suddenly around one and a half, two years old, they're going backwards and they're losing and they're, uh, they're falling. They were walking and then suddenly they start falling down. Uh, they, they were able to play and use their hands to, to feed themselves or whatever play. Uh, and now suddenly they can't do that. And they develop these symptoms like hand wringing where they rub their hands uh, together. It's called hand washing sometimes. For boys, they have no extra. It's, it's XY. So if they have a, a broken gene on the X chromosome, there's no backup. So they don't, the condition is not sustainable for life. And they, they just, they don't survive a childbirth or they die very, very quickly. Henry was a very unique case. So unique, they didn't quite understand it in that he had a mutation, but it wasn't complete. It wasn't a hundred percent. Had his mutation been more severe, he wouldn't have survived birth or wouldn't have survived the first few months of life. Instead, his, his mutation was severe enough that it limited him horribly, but not so severe that it, that it, it killed him. So just to continue on the genetics and then I'll, then I'll stop and, and ask another question. So what, what I learned is, is basically you have to think of the chromosomes are these fields trees, these large structures in our body where genes live. And the genes are the basis of, of everything we are. The, the, the genes determine how we look, what we, how we feel, how we produce action, how we process the world, how we move our bodies, how we think. Everything is controlled by our genes. And the way genes control our actions is by producing specific proteins. So if you have the chromosomes, the chromosome houses genes, and the genes produce action. And they produce action by, by making proteins. So his particular gene that was broken was called MECP2, uh, MECP2. And when girls have this, this gene that is defective, it's called Rett syndrome. In boys, since it's so rare and it, since it manifests itself differently, you can call it boy Rett. Uh, that's what a lot of people do call it. I've called it that before. I've called it that on air before. It's not, it's not inaccurate. It's just, if, you, if we're talking about a subtle conversation here, it, there, is, there, is very, there are very significant differences between how a boy uh, has read and a, and a girl has uh, read. And actually, if, for, for journalists, it's very important to understand when talking to people with special diseases that there's so many different gradations. Not everyone who has Rett syndrome is going to be the same. Uh, There's certain uh, women who have it, and they survive into their 40s and 50s. And there's certain, uh, and some of them can walk, and some of them can uh, can uh, talk a little bit or communicate with with eye gaze technology. Uh, and then there's others who are very very severe because to make it even more complicated, if the, 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 the our, our whole body is made up of genetic code. And what, what Henry had was a typo in his genetic code at this particular spot, in this particular gene. And the genetic code is long. Even of this particular gene, the genetic code is long. So depending on where the typo is and how severe it is, it impacts how much, uh, uh, how much uh, of a limitation this is going to be. So all of this is a roundabout way of saying we were forced to learn a lot about genetics, so much so that the, the scientists couldn't uh, understand initially how this could be. And then they told us, yes, he has a mutation of the MECP2 gene. Here it is. And I could see a picture of, of this genetic code. And while everybody else's genetic code should look one way, his had like a typo in it. Think of a, a cluster of, 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 of code that shouldn't be there. 
And we all have little genetic imperfections, whether it's the inability to grow hair or one hair, one eye that's darker than another. And a lot of these genetic imperfections aren't a big deal. The problem is this particular gene, MECP2, is fundamental for controlling the body and controlling the mind. It was described to me as a, a conductor gene. If you have a giant orchestra, this is the machine. This is the gene that regulates all the traffic. It controls the brain. It controls the brain's ability to control and communicate with, uh, with the body and, and communicate with itself. And without it, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to, to focus thoughts, to, to have conscious decisions like, here's, I'm going to choose to go out and reach touch something or unconscious thoughts like breathing or temperature regulation. And, uh, but his gene wasn't entirely, like I said, it wasn't entirely broken. It was just broken enough to put him in a, in a difficult state. So when I first learned this to come back to your initial question, I was sort of like I am right now. I was working. I was in the back of a car. I was in a military convoy uh, in South Korea. And we've been waiting for the results for many months, longer than anticipated because they were confused by them. And uh, the convoy was stopped behind the side of the road. And I actually was standing behind a giant missile launcher. And I spoke with this doctor I'd never spoken to before and said, uh, you know, Mr. Engel, we, we, we have the results. And, and it, I, I said, well, is it, what is it? Is it? And he, could, he was in an awkward position. He couldn't give me the full detail of the phone, which was very frustrating for me because when somebody tells you they have results, you're like, okay, well, then lay it on me. And he was kind of parsing his words a bit. And, but he, I, I got the impression very clearly that this was not small. This was going to be a lifelong, serious impairment that was incurable at, at the time and is still incurable. So that was one of the hardest nights of, of my life, one of the longest nights of my life. And then I uh, went home, I was on my way. Luckily, I didn't have much time left in, um, in Korea to, before I was done with the trip. And then I went home and, and Mary and I had s subsequent conversations with the, with the geneticists and they explained more to us. And frankly, it didn't get, it didn't get better. Those were tough. Those were tough days when we learned that all the future that, that we had been planning, even though we had these, these doubts, um, the future that we'd been planning was, was no longer the future we were going to have and that we were going to love Henry and do the best we could uh, for Henry and try and coax out as much uh, that was inside as we possibly could. And we never gave up on it. Um, and, I, and, I, and I'll get to this point in, in a second. So why don't I stop it there and, and let you um, keep going? Otherwise, it'll become a long monologue. Well, so many questions, but uh, several of our, our fellows now want to jump in. So Hawkin, introduce yourself and ask your question to Richard Engel, please. Hi, uh, Richard. My name is Hawkin Miller. I am a writer for BioNews NFL with the National Press Foundation. I actually had the um, opportunity to interview your wife, Mary, for a story, and uh, she was great, and I, I'm really sorry to hear, hear about Henry. Um, but I wanted to ask, because you did report, you know, a, a, about Red Syndrome and kind of your story for, for today, I'm curious, um, you know, how did reporting on something this close to you kind of change how you went about telling the story or the process of, of producing the story? So why did we go public? And it, we, we, we did it part of that because of our own experience, uh, that what, what happened. Um, when, we, when we found out about Henry's condition at about a year mark, year and a half, unfortunately, that things, I don't want to say started to get, when you have a small baby, and a lot of people in society don't know. If a baby's in a pram and you're pushing, or in a buggy, uh, and you're pushing the baby in the stroller down the street, and the baby looks good, you don't know if 
the baby has a neurological disorder because in or in my, in this case in our case you didn't know because it wasn't uh, he didn't have any physical manifestations of it at this stage he, he would develop them later and we were able to kind of blend in through society and nobody noticed and uh, as he got older however that became that was less and less of an option when he was two years old and three years old, and suddenly he's no longer in a stroller, but he's either way too big for the stroller or when we put him into more of a wheelchair, it's a very different experience. So for the first couple of years, let's say, we could just put him in, in a stroller like every other kid. And people would think, not that we were actively trying to fool anyone, but you wouldn't have to have this conversation all the time, that he was just quiet and but suddenly when he was bigger and we needed to put him in more of a supported uh seating position which is important for the spine and all the rest uh it was obvious now and it felt very lonely suddenly you're now in the playground pushing a child in a wheelchair or you're going down the street and you're pushing a, a child in a wheelchair and you're seeing, or I was seeing, all these other little kids holding mommy and daddy's hands, running to school, swinging on the swings, playing in the park. And we weren't doing any of that. We couldn't do any of that. And we knew this wasn't coming, uh, that, that the prognosis was to get more and more difficult. And it's very isolating. And it's very lonely. And you see the other kids staring at you and at him. And you see the other parents coming and staring at you and you don't get invited to things and you don't eat the snacks and you don't go to the birthday parties uh, and you just sort of feel very alone. And we wanted to talk about it so that people wouldn't feel alone because there are a lot of people who have diseases like that. And it's, it's it, the idea that everybody else's kid is perfect and yours is, is facing challenges is, is not it's not a good feeling to have. It is not correct. Every, every kid faces some sort of obstacles and challenges. These were very, very you know, severe. So uh, I felt good about it. Uh, Mary felt good about it. It's the wrong word. Uh, we felt it was important to do um, for other members in this community who didn't have the platform that we had. You know, I happened to work on television. So we had a, a, an ability to reach out and connect to a wide audience and let them feel less alone through our story. Now, had I been a neurologist, I would have taken a different approach, but that was the tools that, that I had at my disposal that I could, that I could bring to the, to the mix. And also, selfishly, we were trying to push this cause. We wanted more research dollars going toward these kind of neurological diseases. We wanted more awareness about these kind of neurological diseases because we hoped we were going to find a cure for Henry and for other children like Henry in real time, in enough time to, to, to save him and to correct this problem. Because that's, in a way, the, the horrible tragedy about all of this is that these kids are sick, but except for one code problem they're not there's nothing really wrong with them it's not like uh, if you're in a car accident right in your car and there's a trauma and there's fire maybe you have a punctured lung or you lose a leg you're you're actually really injured and if you lose part of your brain in a car accident or you have your arm ripped off then then there's only so much you can do about it you have to put a mechanical one on he had all the pieces there his heart was in good shape his brain was actually in, in, in as far as we could tell in good shape everything was healthy it was just that it wouldn't boot on. The, 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 the conductor wasn't showing up at work and doing what, what, he want, what he was supposed to do. And we worked so hard to try and retrain the muscles. And you look inside the, 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 the child. And, and for me, this has been one of the hardest things uh, out of all of this. Is every, Henry has a, had a light inside of him, a spirit, a personality. That was Henry. And I could see it and I could see it and it was more and more hidden 
the more this disease took hold. And when he was young, and I look back at the, the little video, the, the videos from when he was very young, and I didn't even know when he was moving, he could crawl when he was, uh, when he was younger, and he could make noise and he could feed himself. And then as this disease got stronger and stronger and stronger, it was like he was more coated in this armor and that, that shine, that spark underneath was harder and harder to see. So we always kept looking for it. But as the disease got, got more entrenched, it became more of a challenge. And, um, and I, th I think that's something that we wanted to share mostly for this other community, not for the wider public, but for the parents around the world who are facing these things and feel either alone or they don't have the ability to reach out and find out about the research. Um, it's very expensive to have a special needs child. So we just wanted to be empathetic for, for, for a wider audience. And Mary was uh, and still is very active online. You spoke to her. Uh, connecting with families, connecting with parents, connecting with caregivers. Uh, so that was why we decided to, to do it. And then we, we followed the journey. And for example, we, we followed Henry's journey during COVID and wanted to say, hey, you think COVID's hard uh, for everybody? Yeah, it is, but it's much harder if you're totally dependent on the system and you're totally dependent on physical therapy and you're totally dependent on bus services and you're totally dependent on a million kinds of things. And and then and suddenly those things all go away. Okay, sorry about that. My mother calling on the other line. <laughs> Bless her heart. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, we'll we'll rush it along so you can talk to mom. Uh, we have two more uh, fellow questions: Namat and then Portia. So Namat, introduce yourself to Richard. Hello, this is Namat Kreitli from Lebanon. I do respect and appreciate all the hardships that you faced, the challenges everything this is really um, amazing uh, to to the to the whole world i have a question which is related to the therapeutic nutrition to what extent do you think that therapeutic nutrition for example um, the alkaline vegan uh, keto diet for example can uh, affect the rare diseases uh, even not not only for the child but for the mother while she's pregnant and why she's breastfeeding. Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure, of course. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not a physician, so I'm not in a position to, to prescribe any kind of practices. But I know, I know what you're talking about, that a lot of families, because, okay, so once you've got a, a child, and let's say his, his, it, it, it could be Rett syndrome, it could be fox g one it could be many of these uh, neurological or, or rare diseases. Once they're at a, a stage where they're totally dependent and henry uh, soon was at a stage where he couldn't he couldn't control his hands anymore and, and we had to feed him and then okay so his diet is, is now our problem and he can't he couldn't speak so we, we communicated with him through yes no cards and we watched him and so we had our our own private way of, of communicating which was very important uh but the, the diet was on us and uh it's even more so when you have uh uh, children or, or adults who are on feeding tubes, then the diet is entirely on you. And some families use um, a uh, like a keto diet to control seizures. And I believe actually the keto diet, one of the reasons it was one of the ways it was founded de decades ago or years ago, was in order to help control seizures. Some families had success with that. Uh, we actually uh, didn't have tremendous issues with with seizures. And so our focus on diet was to make sure that he stayed healthy and going to the bathroom. Bathroom was a major problem because, you know, the bathroom takes a lot of muscles and a lot of muscle control to squeeze your bowels and have a, has a, have a proper bowel movement. So bathroom was a major, major issue for us uh, for his entire life. So a lot of it was about texture, about liquids. It's about finding that right balance where you want to get food inside of him that moves through him, but also gives him enough nutrients. And I spent a lot of time focusing on the diet. It was also for me, uh, a, a way to share pleasure with him.
because you know these kids they can play but they can't really play in the same way uh they can watch tv or movies but some of them uh, can't necessarily process what's going on on the screen and others can so there's a there's a big range uh, but food and, he, and luckily he was fed by fed by mouth his, his entire uh, life and some kids that's that's not possible because they have such a delayed swallow or their their bodies in a in a contorted position it makes it really difficult for them to to swallow but we fed him by mouth uh, and that was for me and my wife a time to connect where you could he liked food thank god he liked food so i would make a big show and i would make food and i would do a little presentation for him in italian like it was a, he was at a fancy restaurant and I would bring it out and I would show him the food and I would arrange it nicely on, on the plate. And then we would texturize it, you know, blend, uh, blend it up and, 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 and serve it to him. But even then it was blended up. We would re I would redecorate the plate so that it looked good because you also, you know, eat with your eyes. So for us, food was not just nutrition, it was play. And everything that we could do that would, that would, would make play uh, was play. And, and, I think that helped. Uh, I think diet is not something you should uh, ignore, uh, not just for the therapeutic benefits, but for the bonding benefits. For the you know, these kids have a very limited experience. They're not going to go on a bicycle or go ride a motorcycle or go for a jog or whatever. So, what can they do? Food. All right. What can I do with that? I can do a lot of things with food. Texturize. Okay, that's fine. I can texturize lots of different things and and make them smooth, but like chocolate mousse and he loved chocolate mousse toward the end when he was doing really bad we ate a lot of chocolate mousse you know give him give him give him the inputs that that you know that help so i don't I, you'd have to talk to a nutritionist you'd have to talk to a nutritionist about the benefits of keto versus another keto we never tried it but i can tell you we spent and i spent a lot of time thinking about food in order to keep him happy, engaged, entertained, and keep his, his, his stomach moving. Portia? Having your story, I'm now having a child with rare diseases in less developing countries. It's really expensive, especially when parents are even struggling to make $1 a day. Because of that, many are not having access to healthcare. Tell us about your Henry's, in Henry's situation, how are you able to fund his treatment? And for many parents who are even struggling to raise money, what's the way forward for them? Thank you. It's, there's no way to sugarcoat it. It is extraordinarily expensive. And we were fortunate in many ways that I have a good job and I, I earn you know, a good salary and I have a very supportive company and I have good health insurance. So uh, I had a lot of things in my, in my favor here. Um, so we never, we were always able to, uh, to take care of him. Also, Mary, I don't want to say it didn't work because she worked tremendously hard, but Mary didn't have to go to an outside job. So this was her job. And it was her job 24-7. She slept in the same bed with Henry his entire life. She was with him at his side all of the time. It was an extraordinarily busy and difficult and emotionally draining unpaid job. If you can't afford that, if you have to work, or you're in, in a situation where you're living in, in poverty and you can barely feed yourself, I, I, it's, it's almost too hard to describe. Uh, and, and I've seen places where they have uh, this, where there are rare diseases, in, 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 in societies that are under stress and it's friend, it's terrible. It's very disturbing. Usually what happens is these kids get neglected. They get locked in some sort of room. They get passed on to some other relative or they get uh, slammed into some institution, which are often cases, these institutions in, in a lot of countries are waiting rooms to die. They just put you there and you are there until you die. They don't actively at least the ones I've known, you know, beat you or anything like that, but you're there uh, to, to take the burden off of your family. I saw an institute like that here in Ukraine and because of the war and because of traditional stigmas and, and this is not a, a wealthy country either. They, the children who have severe diseases are just put 
in, in an institute. They don't really get treatment. They don't get physical therapy. They do a little arts and crafts for those who can. And those who can't stay in their beds and develop scoliosis and die. So it is, it is a tremendous problem because each, each disease, as I was saying earlier in my sort of somewhat rambling preamble, is so unique. Each patient is so different um, that, that, that each, each one of these patients needs full-time medical staff just to keep them going and happy and, and their body moving. So I, there aren't good answers to what a society uh, that is under stress can do, what is a family that is totally uh, facing economic uh, ruin, what can they do? The only answer is do what you can, rely on your family, get help, rely on your friends, make the answer yes. If people offer to help, say yes. We took, even though we have, my wife wasn't working and I had a good job, we still needed help. It took an arm. We had everybody, neighbors, friends, therapists coming over on their day off because it's 24-7, 365 days a year, um, and it doesn't get better with time. So use what you have and, and hope that you have some strong family, friends, support network because you're going you're gonna to need them. So I'm sorry I don't have a good answer, but yes, it's really expensive. It's really burdensome. And if you're already facing many, many obstacles, it's a problem. You know, I've seen families where one of the members, one of the, the mother or father who has a child like this, they're also struggling. Maybe they have their own problems or substance problems, or they're not emotionally equipped to deal with it. You need somebody who is. So it's, it's grandmother or relative or it's too, it's too hard uh, to do on your own and, and you need you, you, you need a, a huge support network. It's the hardest thing you could possibly imagine. Richard, yesterday we got a really strong grounding in the data and the sort of advances in research that have occurred over the past uh, three decades or so. And one of the things I walked away with from that grounding was the fact that the more parent who's struggling and desperate for information, the more he or she learns it can almost heighten the frustration because when you learn that your child has this one mutation, that's something missing or some protein that's not there and it's not replaceable and there's no treatment for it, that heightens your anxiety. Am I correct in that assessment? It's you get, and people go through different phases of this. When we first found out, we were so excited about the research, and we still are excited about the research, and they're going to get there. You know, you talked about yesterday, the, there's gene therapy and there's CRISPR. He, has, he had one issue, which was a mutated gene. And if you think of it in computer programming terms, he had one line of code that was wrong, and it impacted everything else. It didn't let the computer sort of boot up. So if you could get him that line of code and fix it, perfect. Great. But the, the problem is also time is not in your favor. The body starts to break down. So uh, it, it, you have to get, you have to help these kids when they're young. So he's born or, or she's born or any of these children are born. They have this, the, the genetic uh, mutation. The body doesn't stay in a, in a steady state. Over time, the body starts to fall apart when the, when the genes aren't telling it what to do. The muscles don't grow in the same way. The bones start to dislocate. You get scoliosis. You develop other issues, breathing issues. Um, so, and, then what, and then that damage is, is, is real damage. It's physical damage. You know, there's not much. It's like being in a car accident or something. It's, it's actual. You need repair. And that's a whole other issue. Once, once these kids, uh, you can't undo, even with gene therapy, you can't undo the damage that is being done. And having their bodies not working properly over time does do damage to the actual bodies. They don't just stay in pristine condition, um, as, as we learned as well. So, and, and that's one of the things you need to work on. So as parents, 
we made our goal, okay, we're going to maintain this little boy. We're going to work on that spark. We're going to see that spark inside. We're going to coax it out. We're going to do as much physical therapy as we can possibly do and he can possibly handle because it's play and it's because it's going to keep that body working. Massage, physical therapy, the best diet imaginable, so much love, so much kisses, so many baths, everything, everything, everything all the time with the hope that when that therapy came, he'd be ready. Unfortunately, you can only fight against, you know, a dam for so long. And toward the end, it was, we were doing everything, we were doing everything, and it just wasn't, it wasn't working anymore. And you'd plug one hole and two other holes would open. So I hope that there is a cure for these genetic diseases through gene editing or, or whatever it comes out to be. But there are going to be a lot of people who, who miss it because you can't go, you can't turn the clock backwards. You know, it's going to be most effective for the kids who get diagnosed today and there's a, something on hand. The kids who have it and are already, I, won't, I don't want to put an age on it, but they're, they're already well into their, uh, their experience with, this, uh, with these rare diseases, it's going to be tough for them. Jackie Opara has a question, and then we'll go back to Hawken, I believe. So, Jackie, introduce yourself. Okay, my name is Jackie Opara from the eastern part of Nigeria. You see, I want to know how you dealt with stigmatization because we had an uncle that had a rare disease, and because of the culture and tradition, it trickled down to us because people say, oh, these people have this rare disease. You can't marry into that family. You can't do that. So look at all the years that passed through, and it is still affecting us. So how did you, you know, we also had to deal with it. How, yes, how it's, do a, it's, it's, it's horrible. It's, it, 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 it's one of those things that makes me angry that these kids have it hard enough in life and their parents have it hard enough in life because it's burdensome. It's expensive. It's 24 hours. It's physically hard. You know, we had to carry Henry around and that meant up and down stairs and that meant in and out of chairs. And it meant, you know, it's physically, physically taxing too. Um, I'm not making us, he, he worked 10 times harder than he did and, and suffered 10 times more than we did, but it's tough. And then to be ostracized on top of it and have your family pay a price for his, because he's suffering for something that he, he has nothing to do with. It's, it's a shame. We dealt with it partly by talking about it. Um, but it, it's a lot of it's societal, you know, I, I think you are talking about in Nigeria and I've seen that in other cultures where they, you know, there's this idea, well, we don't want our children playing with those children because they could somehow get it or it could set them back. We want our child to be an overachiever and we want them to be speaking four languages and be training to a doctor, but be a doctor by the time they're 14, we can't have them uh, hanging out with any special needs kids that could harm them. And, and I think we need to tell people that that's not the case, that they can learn a lot by experiencing the full range of, of what our society is, is all about. You know, the same way I learn a lot in war zones, not because I particularly like being in war zones, they, they're terrible. You know, it's, it's the worst thing that a society can do to another society is attack it with its military and, and, and vice versa. But uh, that is part of the human experience and, and, and people who are struggling with their bodies, struggling with their genetics are part of the human experience. So societies that, that, that cast them aside and then punish the families on top, I think it's just education. It's like teaching your kids to respect the environment and not, you know, throw plastic bags into the river. You got to teach them. Don't be like that. Respect your uh, people who are the challenging in life. You got to respect them more because they can't defend themselves. So it's just a, it's a struggle. Everything about these rare diseases is a struggle from the stigmatization to the costs, to the sometimes false expectations that a, a, a cure is immediately going to fall out of the sky. Um, nothing about this process is easy. Hawken, we're going to let you ask one more question, and then we're going to start to think about letting you leave, Richard, although we would love <laughs> to have you spend the rest of the day with us. Hawken. Yeah. 
Um, I could ask you so many questions, but I'll, I'll try to keep it to one. But um, one, one quick thing, um, Richard, is uh, talking about the segmentization. I, I have uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and so I can relate to, you know, I'm able to walk a little bit, but I use a chair. And then when I stand up to walk from my chair, people are like, what just happened? And so, like, it's definitely understanding, you know, how all this works in education. But uh, to, to follow up on my first question, you shared about why you wanted to share your story. I'm curious as a journalist, you know, producing content or producing a story about something that affects you so personally and deeply, do you think that um, how that how that affects you and, and telling that story? And, you know, for me with my condition, I always, you know, am battling whether or not, you know, I have some bias when I'm telling the story or if I can't. Oh, I have a I bias. Can. Oh, I have a yeah. bias. I want the best for for Henry. These weren't you know, investigative stories, we were telling his story. So I wasn't trying to be an objective journalist when it came to talking about Henry. I was trying to describe his story to a boy we still love. He's gone, but we still love and love profoundly. So I wasn't trying to, you know, there was no attribution. You know, according to scientists, they say, you know, this was our child. And we knew him and we knew his story and we were trying to bring it out to, to the world. So it was unlike regular journalism. It was more, we're going to let you into our lives for a little bit. And we're going to tell you something about us and our son and maybe other people out there can connect to it in, in a way. But I will tell you, it did impact my, my journalism, my traditional journalism in a way that I didn't ex expect. I think it made me more empathetic. Uh, I, I think over the years, I de developed a little bit of compassion fatigue. And, and that's something that a lot of war correspondents or ER nurses develop when you're just going from one disaster to another and you see lots of people who are uh, dead. And I was at a bombing site uh, right a few hours ago, but not even two hours ago. And uh, there was a dead person and there were dead people yesterday. I was at a mass grave a couple of days ago. So when you do this time and time again, and I've been doing this for 20 plus years, you, you get a little bit of compassion fatigue. When ha what happened with, with Henry ripped all that away. It tore me back to my soul. I've never cried so much in my entire life as I, as I did for Henry. I cried every single day, every single day, because you want more for him. And when you see him struggling, you want more and you want to do better. And um, so I, I think it broke me down again in a way that may have been positive. You know, it, it scraped away some of the hard callus that had that had built up over time. Yeah, thank you so much, Richard. Appreciate your time and your openness. I'm going to again start to think about letting you go by asking you to sort of advise us on what difference it can make for journalists to explore this topic, produce more contextual stories about this issue. Do you feel that we can really contribute to moving the needle towards getting that treatment, getting those answers that the parents need? Why not? I mean, everybody, every year I see, you know, it's, and I'm not trying to be disparaging, uh, uh, using an example is always a bad thing, but uh, you see uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month or something like that. It's like, we are aware of breast cancer. Like, we have a pretty good handle on that. And I know it's terrible and I know it kills lots and lots of women and it's, it's a terrible disease. But these diseases, I think, are more prevalent in society. They don't get the kind of attention that they deserve. They are so. Um, they're so oppressive that, that they, they can potentially sink an entire family. They're so costly to deal with because someone really needs to be by that, that child or that adult side 24-7 in some of these complicated uh, diseases. So uh, it, it's, it's more than just uh, a lot of, it's more than just the diseases that get the average uh, attention uh, that that we spend a lot of you know their campaigns that we do every year uh, wearing a, a particular kind of uh, pink ribbon or a rubber nose or whatever and I'm not trying to to disparage any of those things because those are those are real too um, but they're just not my they're not my issue 
So I, you always think your issue is the most important, but I do think that the, the rare diseases are incredibly important because they're not that rare and they are fixable if you can get them in time and you can cor- correct the genetic code. And I think people in society don't really understand the basics of genetic the same way they don't understand the basics of of evolution. They don't understand the basics of the environment, uh, which is why we're destroying the environment and, and why we're still fighting over you know lots of different things. But people don't understand that we are genetic code. And that's what we are. We are walking, leaving, living, breathing genetic code. And sometimes that genetic code is, is, is messed up. And it's through no fault of our own. And we just need to have a basic understanding of, of what that means and what it can do. And, you know, eventually there will be gene therapies and personalized gene therapies. And I, I can't wait for that day. I hope there's not another, uh, uh, you know, father families don't have to, to go through what we went through. So if people have a, be- a better sense of, of what, what it's like, uh, what these genetic uh, diseases can do, um, how they're all around us, how we're all susceptible to them, uh, because we are nothing but but our but our genes. Um, I guess we can learn too. Their society puts puts its fingerprint on us as well. In our education, we're not all genes, but at our core, uh, it's all genes, and then we sort of calibrate them based on our experiences and and what we've been taught. Uh, so I think there is it is an important thing for people to to learn about the same way that. You know, it's important to, to to improve our society the same way we want to learn about the environment too, so we don't keep destroying it. Well, uh, someone has just commented that Rare Disease Day is February 28th uh, next year. And so uh, I think I can speak for all of the fellows in this program when I say that we are all going to carry Henry's story in our hearts and in our minds as we move forward with this program, with our reporting, And we're going to carry a tremendous amount of gratitude to you for your willingness to step out of of a place of grief and use his memory to support other families. So thank you. And that's that's the most we can do at this stage. So keep keep supporting the research, support other families, tell them what this is, that they're not alone, that they shouldn't be, uh, uh, you know, uh, ostracized or feel... You know, a lot of uh, kids, these parents, they don't, they don't want to go outside. They're afraid to go outside. They're afraid of those looks. They're afraid. Uh, we had a birthday party for some special needs kids. It was the first birthday party most of them had ever been to. And we had it at our house. And it's, it's complicated to have six kids, or I think it was eight, uh, some of them with two carers each, all in different wheelchairs, all with different food needs. Um, uh, some had feeding tubes, but fine, we did it. And I felt great about it afterwards because no, they never, they never had a birthday party for them. I'm, I, we're going to share some of the stories that the journalists produced with you, but in the meantime, please stay safe. Please stay in touch with us. We, we definitely will stay in touch with you and thank you from the bottom of my heart for uh, participating today. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. 